and welcome. My name is James Packman and I'm the Rector, the Senior Minister here at Holy Trinity Church in Nailsey and I'm delighted to welcome you to Sunday Catch Up. Sunday Catch Up is where we take the Bible reading and the talk from last Sunday but make it available on the internet to those who might be blessed and encouraged by it and I hope that you are. If you would like to be in contact with us, please do get in contact. The details are on our church website, uh, www.htnailsy.org.uk. Please let us know if you've got any questions or if there's any way in which we can help you at this time. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you can. May God bless you today. So this evening's reading is Luke chapter 9 verses 18 to 27 and it can be found on page 1039 of the Church Bibles. Once when Jesus was praying in private and the disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he will be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Shall we pray for Ruth as she comes to speak to us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this written word, which is the living word. We thank you for Ruth for the time she has spent preparing. We pray now that you would anoint her with your Holy Spirit and we pray for each one of us as we listen, that we would open our hearts and continue our walk with you day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mary. And good evening, everybody. Lovely to be here with you. <coughs> when I was a child, we spent a fortnight of every year of the summer holidays in the Lake District because it was my father's absolute favorite place on earth. And every year, we had to climb a different peak. So when I was four, we did Scarfell, and I refused to be carried, walked all the way. And then the next year, we probably did Ilgill Head, and maybe the year after, we might have done Heart of Fell. And then, when I was seven, we did Scarfell Pike, and uh, we came down via Scarfell. We transitioned between the two via Lord's Rake, and I have never been so scared in my life. Uh, we did Great Gable, I had to push my mother up the steep bits. We did U Barrow, which had many, many false summits and was really discouraging. And on every occasion, my father led the expedition 
and we followed as best we could. And generally speaking, I ended up trailing behind once I'd passed being four and, you know, would really quite have liked to be carried when I was about 13, but nobody offered. And uh, after a bit, they'd stop and sit on a rock and wait for me. And then I'd catch up and they'd leap to their feet and charge off again, well refreshed by the nice rest they'd had. So my father was a strong leader. He was very at home in the mountains. He never faltered as to the route. Uh, usually not the best known route and usually not the easiest one. We didn't do zigzags, we went straight up. And, but we would follow him to the ends of the earth and there were days when it really felt as if that was what we were doing. We followed him because he was the leader and he knew the way. We followed him because he had called us to go on that expedition. We followed him because we loved him and he had called us by name, and he would keep us safe. And when the going got tough, we followed him because he was our only hope. Knowing someone, trusting them, and following. Today's reading marked a turning point in the lives of Jesus' disciples, the core team that he had called together to learn about mission and to be ready to carry on his work when he was gone. They'd learnt a lot and covered a lot of ground since Luke chapter 5 when he invited his first few companions. They'd watched him do the most amazing miracles. They'd seen him heal people. They'd seen him care for people's needs in other ways. They'd had hands-on experience of feeding 5,000 people from one boy's packed lunch. Twelve of them had been called out from the crowd to be Jesus' constant companions and to have a kind of crash course in mission work. And today he asks them, not what do you think of it so far, but who do people think I am? And of course, there'd been a whole lot of speculation amongst the crowds about who this extraordinary man could possibly be. And people had been trying to identify him with well-known figures from the past, and they all knew that Elijah was supposed to come back when it was time to usher in God's kingdom. And so they thought, maybe this is it. Maybe this is Elijah. Or they thought of that more recent revivalist preacher, John the Baptist. They thought maybe he's got himself some proper clothes and moved out of the wilderness. But Peter, our favorite apostle Peter, in a flash of inspiration, knows the truth. This is not some kind of forerunner. This is not the warm-up act. This is the Messiah himself, God's chosen one, who is going to set everything to rights. And Peter is spot on. That is indeed who Jesus is. They're privileged to be present at the turning point of the history of Israel, and ultimately the turning point in the history of the world. But in their minds, they have got entirely the wrong picture. They've got a lot to learn about what a Messiah is and what he's going to do. They've got to get rid of a whole load of preconceived ideas. So, says Jesus, don't tell anyone, because now is not the moment. And then, he tries to tell it to them the way it really is. It's one of a number of occasions through the Gospels when he tries to warn them what's going to happen and fails because to them it's just unthinkable. They can't grasp it. Because everyone knew what the coming of the Messiah was going to be like. Think Palm Sunday, but with a war horse instead of that incongruous donkey. Think Hosanna, Hosanna, glory, hallelujah, and triumphant march on Jerusalem. So... What went on in the disciples' heads as Jesus told them different? Verse 22, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Well, yes, they'd seen a bit of that already, actually. They'd seen him sparring with the Pharisees and putting thing, people to rights where they'd got things wrong. There was that time when they were walking through the fields on the Sabbath and he put the Pharisees right about what a Sabbath 
was really for. There was that really embarrassing time when a notoriously bad woman wept all over his feet at a Pharisee's dinner party. Probably the disciples were not too upset to think that the religious authorities were going to be put in the wrong. And, says Jesus, he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. What? When you hear something that simply does not make any kind of sense, the easiest thing to do is ignore it and pretend you didn't hear. So he challenges them about their own position because, as I discovered on my father's Lakeland expeditions, if you're going to follow someone, you have to go where they are going. Verse 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Well, I've always wondered what on earth they thought he meant by that, because crucifixion was totally abhorrent to the Jewish faith. So why would they expect to be going to take up a cross of all things? Paul says this in his first letter to the Corinthians, we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And in his letter to the Galatians, he, he references Deuteronomy chapter 21 with the words, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The Jewish law said that anyone who was killed by being hanged on a tree was cursed. Well, we kind of take that in our stride now because we have a bit of understanding what Jesus was actually doing when he hung on the cross. He was taking on himself the curse that was due to us. But when he told the disciples to take up their cross daily, he hadn't done that yet. Crucifixion was the Roman punishment for people who opposed the Roman laws. <clears throat> and about 20 years earlier, there'd been a massive Jewish uprising and about 2,000 Jews had been crucified. So the disciples knew what crucifixion was for. for. It was for going against the Roman government. And maybe they thought, because they were expecting a political victory rather than the spiritual one that Jesus was trying to put across, maybe they thought he was just warning them about the risks involved in being in a political uprising. We see it very differently with hindsight. But that would make sense in the light of what he says next, verse 24. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. It's a typical Jesus statement, turning logic upside down. And for anyone who really thought about it, he's subtly suggesting that physical life is not really the point. And he goes on to reinforce that, verse 25. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? I think that's something we need to take very seriously in this age of materialism, when we tend to be constantly tempted to find our meaning in money, power, in stuff. What good is that when we can't take it with us when we go? And then finally, in this extraordinary statement of Jesus, the bit that honestly makes me cringe, verse 26, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Because, quite honestly, there are times when I'm a coward and I am ashamed of Jesus and his words. And I hate to think that he's ashamed of me. The trouble with the disciples was that they were completely fixated on the idea of a, of a political coming of the kingdom of God. Right to the very end, beyond Calvary, after Jesus had risen for goodness sake, what's the very last thing they said to him after he died, after he rose, 
and just before he finally went back to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Then they gathered around him, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Still missing the point. So I think that the the teasing little comment which you probably noticed at the end of today's reading was another bit with a hidden meaning. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And they took it to mean, and John's Gospel makes this clear as well, that Jesus would physically restore the kingdom of God in the lifetime of at least some of them. But the kingdom of God is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. And every time we see God at work, and every time they saw God at work, they saw the kingdom. The only one of the 12 who did not live to see Jesus usher in the kingdom was Judas, who hanged himself in remorse for betraying him. So, there are two things which we need to ask ourselves. Who do we say Jesus is? If we're like Peter, we've seen what he's done in the Bible, in our own lives, in the lives of other people around us. We've listened to what he says. We've heard him call us by name then we will say he's God's Messiah, our Lord and Master, the one who can save our soul or our true self, even if somewhere along the way this could mean losing our life. Have you heard him call your name? Do you know that he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, the door by which we may enter into the love of God, the way, the truth, the life? Have you answered his call? And the other thing we have to ask ourselves is, have we counted the cost? I know that in this country and at this time, we're unlikely to be executed for being followers of Jesus, unlike some other countries at this and other times. But there are other temptations. What good is it for anyone to gain the whole world and forfeit their very self? What is more important to us, following Jesus or having a comfortable life? Is our main focus Jesus? Or do other things get in the way? Are we focused on our next holiday, our new kitchen, a day out, winning the cup, retail therapy? Are we keeping up with our Lord, or are we trailing behind? Do we even listen? Do we even hear when he asks us to do something? We follow Jesus because he is the leader, and he knows the way. We follow him because he has called us to go with him on an expedition through this life. We follow him because we love him and he loves us. He's called us by name. He will keep us safe. He will carry us when we can go no further. When the going gets tough, we follow him because he is our only hope. Jesus, we long to follow you more nearly, to love you more dearly, to keep closer to you. We long to keep our eyes above the waves and feel that our soul is safe in your embrace. Lord, give us more faith, more commitment, more love. And may we count the cost and count it nothing compared with knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen.